Hello and welcome to the Walk Around Podcast powered by JMA Group. If you are in the automotive retail space, this is the place to be. I am one of your hosts, Mark Spoto, joined as always by Elliot Shore. Hey now. So today we have a very special guest, uh, truly a legend in the automotive yes. business. Um, and this is the definition of someone who needs no introduction, but for anyone who doesn't know Mike Baruni, um, he got his start in automotive nearly 50 years ago. He's a true entrepreneur, philanthropist. He's been named by Automotive News as one of the industry's 50 visionary dealers of all time. Um, we are so grateful to have him. And one of the quotes that you pulled, uh, Elliot, that he said was, my goal is to help more and more people be successful. Yes. And I love that quote. And our conversation with him clearly shows that translates to automotive, to life, to just helping people. Yeah. I, um, this one was a real treat. I got to say, um, you know, I can't wait to, to listen to it back with everyone here and learn more because it felt like it went by in a flash yes. and there was too much to absorb in one sitting. So we could have talked to him for two hours. We really could have. It was, I, I think this is a, a real treat for all of us. All right. Take a listen to Mike Marooney in the walk around. Well, we are honored to have Mike Marooney Truly. on the walk around podcast. Yes. Mike, thanks so much for joining us and, and taking some time. I'm delighted to be with you and uh, look forward to the podcast. Thank you so much. So, you know, I think everyone's curious. Um, you're basically someone that needs no introduction, but why don't we get a little bit into your background and how you got started? Um, you've been in the business for so long and have seen so much, but how did you develop this love for the auto industry. Did you have a choice? I know you got into the business through your family. Was it something forced upon you or did you jump in willingly? It is beyond willingly. It it started with a deep love for my father. Um, hmm. My dad passed away a couple of years ago at age 98, but he bought his first store in 1955 and literally worked six days a week only because they weren't open on Sundays. So basically if, if I wanted to be with my dad, I had to go to the store. So I've been hanging out in car dealerships <laughs> since literally I was in diapers and developed a love, not only of the business, but really for the people in the business. I've always been fascinated with people in retail and auto retail has its own really special breed. And, and uh, that, that love and passion for the business has continued to this day. Yeah, it's, it is fascinating. The people in the business, it's, there's nothing like the auto business and auto retail uh, is, is uh, at least to me, it's one of the most unique businesses in the world in the sense that uh, it's it's really a merit based system. You know, it's uh, anyone. It's not about education or background or or, or, or uh, where you're from or what you look like. It's a matter of how well you could take care of a customer, which is always fascinating to me um, in terms of the people. I, I couldn't agree with you more. We call it a meritocracy and we have a different word than customers. Our word is guests. So mm -hmm. the, the guest, the guest satisfaction with that transaction and the ongoing relationship are really what determine the fate of the business. And you could have uh, the smartest, richest dealer, the best OEM, but if your people that serve customers, both sales, service, parts, collision, uh, finance, if those people don't have that same guest first mindset, you're not going to be successful. You can't buy your way into this business and you can't buy your way through the business. You have to do it on a, on a, serv a servant leadership mentality. Totally. So Mike, what drove you to South Florida? I know you started up in Buffalo, New York. Was it simply the weather change that you wanted or what, <laughs> what happened there? It actually wasn't. Uh, I think my dad, uh, who I always thought was way ahead of his time, at one time he was the leading retailer of all brands in Western New York. Uh, but he recognized that there was not the same growth opportunities there at that time. That area was shrinking, had different kinds of challenges. He had been vacationing in Florida and realized that Florida had an unlimited potential. So hmm. I went off to college in Colorado and uh, after I graduated, I was on vacation and got a call that he had bought a store in Miami. And he said, 
He said, Dad, that's great. He had been looking for a store for a long time. And he said, guess what? And I said, what? He said, and you're going to run the store. I said, Dad, I don't like South Florida. He said, you'll be just fine. Get your butt home and let's get to work. And uh, Oh, wow. So you had just graduated college when he gave that call to you about going to run the store. Yeah, I, I had actually had one year of experience in between. But the, the amazing thing was I was pretty happy up in Western New York and uh, hmm. vacationing in Florida was more fun than working in Florida. So anyway, we bought a, a bankrupt Ford store in Miami and my dad and I were the only two people, maybe with one or two exceptions that were not bilingual. We built a team from scratch, uh, literally worked seven days a week for two years and uh, took off. And it was a great ride from there. It was uh, really fun, really fun and very challenging, uh, but also very rewarding. Now, did your dad stay up in New York while you went down to Miami or was he there kind of guiding you a little bit or did he just throw you down there and say, go do it? No, he was there and he he commuted between the two locations. Um, and literally, we talked three to four times a day until the day he passed. And uh, oh, wow. so mm. our relationship, seven days a week, we invested together. We did all kinds of different businesses together. And it was a true love affair, but that's what brought me into auto retail. And then I fell in love with the business and then um, we've grown it tremendously since then. Yeah. The rest is history. Well, I mean, it, it's super interesting to me too, because, you know, so I didn't grow, I grew up in New York, um, but, and I moved to South Florida 20 years ago, but to me, you know, your name is is synonymous with South Florida. So it's kind of funny to hear the reluctance to move to South Florida to begin with, because you're, I mean, quite frankly, you're, you're you know, your your name is very much, you have such an impact on the community you, with the Cleveland Clinic and, and what you're doing. I actually live a mile from that uh, Cleveland Clinic in Weston. And, you know, it's amazing what you're doing in South Florida. And to think with AutoNation and your all of your experience there, I mean, could you have ever foreseen any of this happening from that little Ford store in Miami? Absolutely not. Uh, there was a ton of luck, but... Uh, really what it was, LA, is there we, we we surround ourselves with some great people. And the credit for our growth really goes to the team that I worked with. And um, my dad had a, a great ability to uh, assess talent, spot talent, and he taught me some of those characteristics. So, no, we never dreamt of being that big. It was a store at a time. Uh, but what we always believed is giving back to the community, and we continue to do that today. I'm, uh, so pleased you mentioned the Cleveland Clinic. I, I chair the board of the Cleveland Clinic, Florida. I sit on their global board and some of their committees, and I do it just out of the love of the community. And I really believe that for people in our community to have to leave South Florida to get world-class health care is just not right. So our investments in the Cleveland Clinic that were really led by my mom and dad have really changed our life and lives of many others. Absolutely. And I can tell you firsthand, I mean, it. You know, my mother, between my mother-in-law, and my kids, we've we've been to the Cleveland Clinic many times, and they have always done a great job for us. I, I mean, just where we feel very grateful to live a mile away from such a world-class facility and organization. Um, what was it about that uh, that idea that that spoke to your parents and that you continued? What what was it that drove you guys to do that? Very interesting. Um, my mom was a nanny for a doctor when she was growing up and going to college. My mom and dad both went to Buffalo State Teachers College back then. Hmm. And she became um, educated about the education of medicine, not just the practice of medicine, and really believed in teaching hospitals. And uh, when Cleveland Clinic opened in South Florida in a tiny little facility, gosh, 30 years ago, my mom and dad were among their first supporters. And literally gave the Cleveland Clinic millions of dollars. And my dad served on committees. And ultimately, when he asked me to join him, um, it was an easy answer. Uh, and we co-chaired a leadership group at Cleveland Clinic. And then ultimately, he stepped aside and, and I grew and took on more and more responsibility. But again, the credit of the Cleveland Clinic is the world-class doctors. It's a physician-led organization. And right. couldn't be more proud to be associated with them. So that's awesome. But um, so let's fast forward a little bit here. Um, so I had the honor of of, uh, of being a district manager at Southeast Toyota, and um, I got the call on 
you know, formerly Maruni Toyota, now Auto Nation Toyota of Weston. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was reading a lot through your bio and and it's such an impressive bio, but one of the things caught my eye um, and that was your leadership of Auto Nation's technology efforts. And I'll tell you why it caught my eye. Um, Auto Nation, some people may or may not know this, but Auto Nation uses an internally developed CRM a homegrown CRM system, which today is almost unheard of in, in a way because you know you have the, the other competitors of the world or the software providers in the auto industry that provide CRMs. But what amazed me about the CRM that was built in AutoNation under your leadership was how amazingly great it is. And, and especially compared to all of the other CRMs I've ever seen. And so my question, I think, is... You know, take us back to that to those decisions to develop a homegrown CRM. Why was that important? And then further, how are you able to execute that in the way in which you did? Executing technology products in large organizations is extremely difficult. And, and we're really curious, how are you able to have that vision and, and see that through, you know, to know that that would be a competitive advantage for AutoNation to have their own CRM? It's interesting. First of all, I can take absolutely no credit. Although <laughs> you knew you were going to say that, Mike. <laughs> that team reported to me that that vision was not my vision. I was blessed. There was a team led by a gentleman by the name of Scott May, who's still a leader in the industry doing consulting. And he built this really interesting team and they built the CRM. And what's fun is we benchmarked that CRM against others and used independent parties to do it because we constantly asked ourselves a question, are we missing something with internal development? Should we have should we move on to one of the more established products? And every time we benchmarked it, it came back and said, boy, this product is best in class. So we just kept investing in it and improving on it. And, and more importantly, is training our associates relentlessly. We had a very significant training effort, uh, sales service, F&I throughout the company. So your system can be a great system, but having the training infrastructure to make it work and being sure your associates not only had the capabilities, but the desire to make it work mm -hmm. was as important as the technology itself. I think it's such a relevant question for for dealers who are listening and, and others in the industry because there's so many technology platforms and providers that are constantly pitching dealers. So, Mike, from your vantage point, what would you recommend to your fellow uh, you know business leaders when sitting back and evaluating technology and how that could make how could that work for your business? I think to your point, there is so many different software products out there and we're currently subscribed to, it's, it seems like way too many and they're very expensive, <laughs> but a lot of it gets back to, can you integrate them with your DMS? Hmm. Um, can your people understand them? It, I think nowadays it helps to use the bigger providers because the associates you're recruiting in have often had experience in those products. If, right. You know, when launching totally new systems and products, and there's some great ones coming to market, it's really difficult if none of your workforce has ever worked. It's almost like learning a different language. So I, I think it's a it's a big challenge for the industry. It takes leadership both at the corporate level and the store level to make sure that people understand why they're important, how we expect them to use them, and then frankly to to follow up. And you know, with the providers we use, they provide ongoing assistance. Um, they come into the store. Uh, sometimes they work remotely to make sure our new employees are up to speed and that we're fully utilizing the systems. And we're very imperfect, but we try really hard to get the best out of the software. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of great advice, really beyond software in what you're saying. I mean, first of all, I heard benchmarking. I heard constantly challenging yourself to make sure that you're benchmarking your organization against the best, whether that's technology or anything else, really, that can be applicable to. Um, I heard training. I heard constant training and motivation of your associates to want the training, to want to get better as well, is critical to the success of really technology or anything else uh, uh, that you're that you're speaking to. Um, and following up and 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 not letting it go is another is is a reinforcement of that. Um, so th I think that's tremendous advice for anybody. But uh, you know, in thinking about technology, it seems like you can't get away from a, a an, 
an AI discussion these days. Um, <laughs> you know, between Chat GPT, and I'm not going to tell you that we asked Chat GPT, "Hey, can you give us some questions for Mike Maruni?" <laughs> we might have done that. We might have not. Um, but um, but you know, curious in your vantage point as a, as a visionary in the industry. How do you see AI playing a role in dealership operations? Well, let me first answer by being clear that I just made a significant investment in an AI company called <laughs> Stella Automotive. Mm. It, it was a recognition that one, there's a new technology and a new tool in the toolbox that frankly could dwarf all the other tools in the toolbox. Mm. I can remember uh, Mike Jackson, our uh, former CEO of AutoNation, talking about how the what the internet meant to the world, not just to the auto business. Well, I think AI is in the same kind of um, sphere of, it can change everything and mm. to me, 99% of it's the positive. So short-term, what are we using AI for? To improve the guest experience, mm. to make it more consistent, make it more fluid, make it more seamless, make it more timely. Having the phone answered on the first ring, not the third or the 33rd ring. Um, getting guests the right and most accurate answers to their concerns. And we're starting with just a couple of use cases, but I believe it will expand throughout the store. And most importantly, it'll help our associates serve guests better and be more productive. Um, it's not just about the next cool tool. It's about the guest experience and the associate productivity. And I'm very bullish on the potential of AI. And by the way, it's very early. And like every new technology, there'll be some missteps. There'll be some winners and losers. There'll be imperfections. And that's where you have to have a combination of both patience and persistence. Yeah, it's, it's such a great point, Mike, in terms of the capabilities and the potential compared to the internet back then. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, because a topic in our industry that's been a constant has been modern retail. Um, and, you know, you start to mesh these topics together of AI and modern retail and, you know, and, and it really, you really start to, you, your, your kind of brain can explode in a lot of different areas, but, you know, I'm curious to get your take on the state of modern retail today. And let me give you a little backdrop to that. Um, heading into pre COVID, no one saw COVID coming. Right. And there were some dealers that were prepared from a modern perspective, retail perspective, and some that weren't. But COVID flipped everything on its head. Now, you know, we're kind of settling into a new normal. And really, the question becomes, you know, are we taking a step back here in modern retail um, as the business comes back to normal? Or are we full steam ahead? Where, where do you see the state of modern retail today? So I think it starts, and you'll see a redundant comment in our discussion this morning. It all starts with the guest. Mm. And it's about what the guest minds, what the guest prioritizes. And then you go and build the system around the guest and the flexibility. And modern retail, I, I think it was, I think the term was invented by a, one of my former AutoNation associates, Ron Fry, or at least I credit him for that. Mm. And, <laughs> um, I think it's a, a very broad term that basically says, take a deep look at your industry and some of the imperfections in the guest processes and build a retail process that allows guests to shop outside the store, inside the store, make the comparisons, make it efficient, make it timely. And in some cases, walk away from some of the processes that made the guest experience slower and less efficient and less accurate. So, no, I don't think modern retail has peaked and gone backwards. I think it's moving ahead, but it's hard. It's hard to think about how to do things differently. It's hard to train even your most valuable leaders how to do things differently, whether you're moving to a hybrid F&I situation or a one price selling system um, or a single point of contact. Sure. You know, We've got variations of each of those kinds of things that are in development, but it, it's not a one size fits all. It's a guest prioritization that should drive the retail process. And Mike, I think you're hitting on a really interesting point. And I'm curious, when you think about designing your process around the guest and their experience, why do you think some dealers are better at that than others? It, it seems like there are, there are so many dealers that still want to maintain that control of the process, but progressive dealers like yourself and others see it differently. Why do you think that difference exists? 
because the old way has been so profitable. Right. It's hard to walk away from something that you've worked at for many, many years. You've never perfected, but you've really, you've really honed your craft sure. and, and had a lot of success. It's hard walking away from success. And similar to what I mentioned with AI, sometimes there's a few steps backwards before you can go forward. But if you say, listen, I need to compete in a new world, not compete in an old world, you better open your mind up to change. And you know, I'm not the young. I, at one time, I was the youngest Ford dealer in the country. I'm no longer the youngest guy, <laughs> but I want to get better every day, and I want to. I want to take profitable market share. I want to deliver great guest experiences, and you can't do it at doing the old way. So, you know, talking about the old way and, and the transaction, it, it feels like you know there's disruption everywhere, right? And you could point to you know the the online retailers, Carvana. You can point to Tesla and and what they're doing in, with the guest experience and with their sales process. Um, and you know, but I'm curious about something you know from your vantage point. Um, and and having so many years of knowledge in this business, it feels like there's a fight right now for the transaction. And and what I mean by that is there's seems to be a fight between the manufacturers. Uh, and the retailers in terms of who owns that guest experience. To your point exactly, you want to build a great guest experience around your guests, but so does the OEM and so does the manufacturer. And so they're building their own digital retailing or modern retailing tools for you to use. But I don't know that that is the best experience for your guest. So how do you look at the the OEMs and and their seemingly desire to get closer to the transaction and the guest experience versus the retailer's place in the market to providing that guest experience? I think it's a natural friction. First of all, the OEMs are our partners. And like in any partnership, life is not perfect. Right? <laughs> um, they're, providing, they're providing, hopefully, world-class products. <clears throat> We're providing, hopefully, a world-class guest experience. Well, there's times that us as retailers think we know more about product development than they do. <laughs> Excuse me. There's times that they believe that they know more about the guest experience. So it's kind of an ebb and flow. The real challenge, and you called it out, is when an OEM mandates a digital solution or a software solution, it's really hard for those of us that own multiple dealerships and serve multiple brands. Exactly. It's totally inefficient. Frankly, it's not very practical. I say that while still admiring the effort that's put forth and saying, maybe we can take a nugget here and a nugget there and have our own philosophy, but don't do it in an antagonistic way. Do it in a collaborative way and saying, okay, I respect what you're doing. Please respect what I'm doing because we have the same goal and that's delighting guests and creating long-term guest loyalty. So thinking about your operations today and your dealerships, and I love that point, right? Like I think that's a that's very right. very well made. Um, but I'm curious, and you don't have to name the brands, but based on certain brands and what they've said in the marketplace today about their desires, and their and I think it it doesn't take a genius to read between the lines on some of what these uh, manufacturers are saying, but. For you, in terms of your operations, are there brands, and you don't have to name them, but are there brands you wouldn't touch today because of their perspective on the retailer and their perspective on their the retailer's place in the market? I think there's brands that I prefer, but there's not brands that I wouldn't touch for that reason. Hmm. Again, as I said earlier, I think this is a natural friction in some ways, and I try not to get too emotional about it and say, hmm. okay, I understand We've got the same desire. We get there a little bit differently. So yes, we have preferred brands and our brands are really built around the markets we compete in and what we think brings the best product to that market. Just for an example, we have a fairly significant presence in Colorado and we're trying to grow it. Colorado is a huge truck and SUV market. Right. Great. We want to, we want to be able to fulfill. So we'll pick brands that we think have the best product lineup and are able to fulfill that community's needs. It's not based about what their retail philosophy is. Now, if you want to venture off into a direct seller conversation, that's a very different conversation. If obviously, if we ever believe that one of our OEM partners is serious about being a direct seller, that certainly would influence 
how we approach the business and whether we want to partner with that brand. Gotcha. But I don't I don't see that as a threat today. Yeah. But I'm highly aware based on the success of other direct sellers how appealing it is. And so I'm, you know, as we say, our antenna <laughs> is up. Right. But, but you know, we like the partners we have. Mike, I'm curious, you know, there's so much going on in the industry. You've you've seen a lot of peaks and valleys in your experience. Is has there been a crazier time in our business than what's going on right now? <laughs> yes, there has. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was in 08, 09 in the in the bankruptcy of the Great Recession. Yeah. The Great Recession, the financial crisis, that was craziness. And obviously at that time I was there at AutoNation and we were the largest holder of franchises for every major manufacturer. And uh, that was a crazier time. When we talk today about disruption, I actually prefer the term opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I've been part of disruptors, uh, being employee number two at uh, the new vehicle division of Republic Industries. When I left, there was 26,000 of us. Um, today, I'm the lead independent director of Carvana, which is uh, controversial to some and uh, <laughs> admired by many, uh, <laughs> but not by all. <laughs> so I kind of like being part of the next wave of what's coming in the business. And I, uh, frankly, I join companies like that uh, to be part of that change and be part of the growth in the industry. I didn't want to be one that was left behind. I want to be one that was learning about the future. So what has you excited about about the business? You, you know, you mentioned about what's coming. What what has you excited about this this industry? So I think it's funny that the business has been labeled as a no growth business. When you look at and we're active investors in the equity markets as well. When you look at the equity markets and you see OEMs valued at five and six times earnings, what that statement it says is it's a no growth business. Right. I see auto retail as being a growth business now. Yeah. You grow it in so many different ways. You grow it by acquisition. You grow it by taking uh, profitable market share. You grow it by building your installed base or units in operation. So I'm still excited about growth. And in our company, we measure growth. We measure a gazillion things, but we measure growth <laughs> every single month and talk about it. You know, how many service appointments do we get? How many sales appointments do we get? How many cars do we sell? How many cars do we service? You know, all these different metrics, but I'm still excited about the opportunity to grow. Secondly, I'm very excited about the new wave of products coming. Hmm. EVs are fantastic to drive. Um, I've got a couple and I absolutely yeah. love them, but it really goes back to, I look at my grandchildren and I say, do I want polluted air or do I want clean air? Right. Mm. Clean air for my for these next generations. And I think it's our generation's got the responsibility to deliver it. Now, is there challenges in coming into the EV generation? Oh, boy, there's a long list of them. Is there fear about service potential, sales margins? Yes, there is. But I'm still excited about this generation of product coming. Um, and then third, and contrary to what you might hear, the industry is still attracting some very talented people. So Definitely. I, I get excited when I see new people coming in the industry that want to be a part of it, that recognize the opportunity. So the growth of the industry, the EVs and the people coming into the industry all keep me very excited. Well, I'm certainly excited. <laughs> How can you uh, not listen to you, to that? I, you know, it's, and you know, I got to give you credit, you know, something, you know, I think we try to, sometimes push people towards absolutes, towards this or that. And I, I give you a lot of credit. I hear a lot of gray in in what you in in the way you think and in, in the way of you know being a board member of Carvana but also being a car dealer you know and and just it's you know being a partner to the OEM but also understanding to keep your antenna up. You know, there's a lot of healthy tension is what I'm hearing. And and from a leadership perspective is that a leadership principle that that you have, and maybe intentionally or unintentionally, of you know looking at all sides of something and and trying to be living the gray and not maybe in absolutes? I think it is, and I, I think it applies to all parts of our business. And I'll tell you where I really learned it is I learned it at AutoNation. Hmm. Uh, we were so controversial, being we were the highest growth company in America. I think it was in 1998 or 1999. 
it was insane. The speed we were growing, the tension that was created in the OEM relationships, the tension that was created in the dealer community. But it all worked out. You know, it all it, it opened up a new level of valuation in auto retail. Right. Consolidation had its benefits. Consolidations had its struggles, too. But I think you, you take the good and the bad. Um, this is a very old principle. But my dad always used to say, don't get too high when things are good and don't get too low when they're not. Just hmm. keep working hard. Stay true to your principles. Stay true to your people. And things will work out. And life is never perfect. And I I accept the tension in the relationships. Yeah. And maybe it's as I've gotten older, I've gotten a little more mature. I used to get maybe a little more excited about um, some of the potential <laughs> pitfalls. But whether you're talking <laughs> politics or auto retail, it's it's a changing world. And, you know, you just got to figure out how to succeed in that world. Totally. So, Mike, th- there was a recent article about things that we can expect will never change now that the industry has moved past COVID and some of the impacts that COVID has had on on retail and the car buying experience. I want to ask you five things and you tell us what you think on, as to whether these things are true or... Oh, are we doing a spot- Spotify? Maybe, maybe an impromptu Spotify. Oh, okay. Yeah, a little little uh, experimental section. That's Mark's uh, last name, Spoto, and uh, Mark is going to give you uh, a few... Uh, a little uh, rapid fire. A little, little rapid fire action. Let's go. Okay. Here we go, Mike. Are we ever going back to 2019 inventory and incentives levels? Yes, selectively. Um, I think there are people that will uh, say things and people that will do things. I mean, at the OEM level, everybody, <laughs> everybody recognized that low inventories and low incentives drove higher profitability, both at an OEM level and at the dealer level. But it's really difficult to sustain uh, in a business with as high a fixed cost as manufacturing is. So it costs a lot of money. It sure does. To manufacture a vehicle. So I, I think I think it'll be so I think selectively it will go back. Yeah. But okay. not totally. Hopefully we learn from our mistakes. Hopefully. So that leads me to the next one. We continue to see high prices for consumers. You know, two thirds are paying above sticker, record average selling price, monthly payments over seven hundred. Is that going to continue? Boy, I hope not. Um, My single biggest worry in the business by far is affordability. Hmm. And I am always concerned about having a two-class system in America or in any country around the world of the haves and the have-nots. And currently, the pricing, the interest rates, the vehicle content is too expensive, whether it's new or used. And it is a huge, huge problem. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know... I think it, as a retailer, you're trying to acquire um, less expensive used vehicles, and we're generally doing that in a private world rather than in an auction world. Um, as a new vehicle dealer, you want a full lineup of vehicles. Yes, we made a tremendous amount of money the last couple of years selling high content vehicles, but we left behind a huge part of our owner base that has a very different need. And by the way, that need really expressed itself in, in tremendous growth in service. Um, totally. The, the industry typically grew 3 to 5% in service. Uh, we saw growth rates between 15 and 20 in some of our stores, and it's been sustained in the teens. And to me, it's a direct reflection of affordability and high prices and pressure on the consumer. Wow. So true. Yep. Okay. I think I know your answer to this one. Dealers should be prepared to sell fewer new cars than they once did. That's interesting. I think the new competition in the market will always splinter it. It, You can go back to when there was just the big three and then the big Hmm. Japanese three came in and then the European luxury market exploded. There's going to be more and more competition. So yes, there's a possibility of having less new vehicle throughput. But if you're a competitive entrepreneur, you say, I take that challenge and totally. I've, got to, I've got to figure it out, whether I need to spend more in marketing, more in training, more in different areas. Um, you've got to fight that trend. But certainly, as there's more entrance, uh, the pie gets diluted. The, the, the SAR has never gotten well over 17 million on a sustained basis. It's not going to be 22 million or 24 million. So yes, there's a certain amount of pie and it's going to be a great competition fighting for that pie. 
Well, as uh, Jim Cramer says on uh, Mad Money, there's a bull market somewhere. It's a matter <laughs> of finding it, you know. But Okay, so next one, real quick. We should prepare to see fewer lease deals continue. I think it I think you can tie the least penetration back to production. When mm. there's overproduction, leasing is a very good way to stimulate the consumer without screaming distress by subsidizing lease payments. Yep. Leasing works for some people really, really well. It's interesting in some parts of the country, leasing is huge. South Florida being one. Yep. Colorado, it's not big. Uh, so it's it's market driven. But leasing is, in my opinion, a quiet way to stimulate the market. And I think leasing will always be a factor, but it'll be a bigger factor when there's overproduction. You know, it's funny. Someone was saying to me the other day that you walk into an AT&T store these days and they're basically car dealers. It's, do you have a trade-in? Oh, I can lease you this and you can get a new one every time. And so it's funny. It's funny to see other industries pull sure. from, you know, some of the, the practices that car dealers have employed to keep retention, really, and, and an affordable payment for a customer. And to be honest, it's not the dealers, it's the OEMs that do it. They're the ones that subsidize the lease rates. They're the ones that arrange with either captive lenders or uh, third-party lenders uh, these deals, and and dealers are the beneficiary of it. Right. Yeah, great point. And last one before we get to a sure thing, mm -hmm. consumers should expect to continue to pay more for used cars. I hope not, but the next three years are going to be very difficult with yeah. less new vehicles being produced, less fleet, um, less rental, which is obviously fleet. Uh, I think in less off lease vehicles, I think prices are going to stay higher than they should be. And it's a real problem. It's an, it's a problem to the used car sellers. It's a problem to the new car dealers, but more importantly, it's a problem to our guests is, is those prices and today's interest rates make, retailing make growing the used retail business a real challenge definitely mike we can talk to you all day all day but we want to get to a sure thing and and elliot here yeah. has some hot takes yeah some car related some not car related yes and we're going to ask you is it a sure thing or not a sure thing what yes. so we'll start with an industry one and um we talked a bit about modern retail and and i'm going to put a number and i'm going to take a perspective here um that I believe the guest experience, the physical guest experience is still going to be the most critical part to a car transaction now into the future indefinitely to the point that I believe that total total car online sales, meaning where the customer never steps foot in any sort of retail environment, will never be more than 20% of the entire market, sure thing or not a sure thing. Not a sure thing. <laughs> he said that so emphatically. That really quick. The other thing, Mike, is I love to keep score. So right, now, for one. right now he's 0 for 1. But, but to elaborate, please. Write, write it down, okay? Uh, <laughs> because I could be wrong. I've been wrong many times before. And I, I really go back to my experience at Carvana. And uh, this is not a Carvana commercial. But when I first approached, was approached by the company to join their board and did my research, I was very skeptical whether you could sell those kind of products online. Hmm. Every product was different. Every condition was different. And they have proven they could do it. Now, can can people do it profitably? I think it will as the industry, as the industry goes on. But having trust assurance, whether it's money back guarantees or warranties or whatever, create a safety net for consumers that allow them to take that risk. It's much easier and new than it is in use. But they've proven they can do it and used. And I think that you can't underestimate the convenience of that experience of I buy online, I get an instant uh, trade value, right. I get instant credit approval, I deliver a vehicle to our house. And by the way, all of us traditional retailers are now doing the same thing. We do free delivery anywhere in the States. We do uh, remote online appraisals. We do remote... Things. So there's always these things that are developed in what you call the disruptors. I call the opportunists. And the, we've now adopted them into our business. And I I don't know what the exact percentage is, whether it's going to be over 20, but it's a, it's definitely a hybrid experience today. Mm -hmm. People get, gathering information, people beginning their shopping experience, 
But yes, I still value the brick and mortar side. I value the smell of the vehicle, the touch of the vehicle, the test drive of the vehicle, and the value add by our associates. And when we stop adding value, then the direct sellers get a, a different advantage. Totally. Well, I don't like to be on the other side of a Mike Rooney <laughs> opinion. So we'll see how this plays I mean, out. It's hard to argue with yeah. that, right? I and I and I'm gonna remain true to my conviction and not go back okay. despite that very, I would say, persuasive the plea. Sweet. Very yeah. uh, so, um, but let's move on. Uh so um some people may not know this, but you were at one time a uh an owner, a partial owner into the Florida Panthers. And, um, you know, it's interesting to see where sports valuations have gone these days. Um, they have gone through the moon. And, you know, it's really tough. If you want to be a owner of a sports franchise, you know, these days, um, and you're not a billionaire, right, it's almost impossible. But, you know, like any good uh, entrepreneur or, or uh, investor, you're looking to buy low and sell high. And so I believe that if anyone was investing in a league today, and we're going to go by league, not individual franchise, but I believe the single best place to invest in a sports franchise today would be MLS and Major League Soccer because Messi mania is real. And MLS will be the biggest growth engine of any professional sport over the next decade. Sure thing or not a sure thing. Absolutely sure thing in America. Wow. Yeah. Here we go, Elliot. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's it's amazing. And even pre-Messi and, you know, got to give tremendous credit to the Moss family in South Florida for putting together a Beckham, a Messi, and totally. all the people that are coming with them. I mean, it takes deep pockets and real conviction and great credit to them. But there's kind of catalysts in, in different points in different industries. And, and certainly this is a catalyst for soccer in the U.S. And I think it's very exciting and uh, credit to the, the people that are investing there. And I think you'll see the valuation of those franchises skyrocketed, uh, just like the clubs in Europe have been. Totally. Mike, is that a hint that you might be getting into that game? No, I've been cured. Uh, I invested <laughs> in professional sports. I, I didn't experience, you know, in, in different industries, you get into different points in times. I didn't experience those skyrocketing valuations. Uh, <laughs> right. we, we experienced a major cash drain, but we had a great time doing it. And it was something our whole family got behind. My dad invested, I invested, and a bunch of our friends invested. And uh, we weren't as successful on the ice, but we sure had fun doing it. And yeah. it was a great chapter for our family. Well, well, the Panthers have certainly proven some success. Yeah, uh, certainly recently. Yeah, we're, we're still season ticket holders, and we cheer them on. And uh, I give Mr. Viola all the credit in the world for bringing the capital and the passion. And what a great run it's been the last couple of years for Florida Panther fans after a long drought. Right. Totally. And I'm a season ticket holder as well. And maybe I'll see you at a game. <laughs> <That's> great. <laughs> all right, last one. All this right. might be my favorite yeah. thing of all time. So, um. So, you know, it, uh, across the history of advertising, um, there has been a lot of amazing jingles that have been created over the years. I mean, just, I mean, who can forget, give me a break. Kit Kat. Kit Kat, right? Uh, Five dollar. Foot long. Right? Subway. <laughs> we got Subway. Um, the newest one, I would say, you know, in modern times, my kids sing it all the time, but BK. Have it your way. Have it your way at BK, right? But to me, there is a single best jingle of all time. Especially if you grew up in South Florida. Especially if you grew up in South Florida. You probably never even knew what Ghostbusters was. Because all you heard in South Florida 24-7 was, if you need a car, truck or van. Who are you going to call? <laughs> Maroonie. And so it's a sure thing that the Maroonie jingle of who are you going to call is the single best jingle of all time. Sure all thing right. or not a sure thing? I'm totally biased, but absolutely sure thing. <laughs> <laughs> and first of all, I got to give credit to a gentleman who's now deceased by the name of Zev Auerbach. Started with the Ed team, later joined Zimmerman, who is the genius behind that. And uh, even True today, genius. That, that, is, that has not been run for over 10 years but as the tour boats go by our house in Fort Lauderdale, people still sing the jingle. <laughs> that is daunting. It's really amazing. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you is at AutoNation, we then expanded that jingle to markets all around the country. 
before we had moved to common names. And I would get calls from friends of mine around the country going, they stole your jingle. They stole your jingle. <laughs> That's too funny. They, Mike, they, we got to ask, we got to ask, was it a high price tag to buy I mean, the rights? Ray Parker Jr. I mean, he must have made out like a, like a bandit yeah. with, with the usage of that song. Yes, it was a high price tag, but <laughs> it got higher every year. So <laughs> it, we initially bought it regionally and then later bought it nationally. But it was it was a brilliant move. And again, uh, uh, to Zeb and Jordan Zimmerman and that crowd, I, I give them all the credit. And uh, it's something that is will be forever linked with our last name. Uh, and it was really fun. Well, well, Mike, I think the industry owes you a great deal of credit. Because, 100%. Uh, certainly, you have built an amazing business, an amazing company. Your your experience, your impact is far-reaching. On and, the community, on people, yeah. on, on all sorts of areas. We can't thank you enough for joining us uh, and spending some time on the walk around. Thank you so much, Mike. Well, thanks for having me. Let me just make one last comment. Your comments are just touched my heart and they're so gracious. But... I'm blessed to be in the industry and I've been blessed to work with fabulous people and all the success we've had are is really because of that. It's not just because of me or my family, but we've enjoyed the ride and I can't wait for the next chapter. We're ready. Yeah, sounds great. We're ready too. All right. Thanks, Thank you so much, Mike. Me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mike. Have a great day. Thank you so much for listening to us on The Walk Around. This podcast is produced by the team at the JMA a Group. Special thanks to Caitlin Swanson, James Gunn, and Michaela Gerritsen for helping us produce this episode and others. If you're a dealer owner, if you're a general manager, regardless of your career in automotive, you are sure to pick up some insights on well, The Walk Around. I like what you did there. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's nice. And uh, we uh, we appreciate all of our listeners. Uh, you can find us anywhere you, where you can find podcasts, Apple, Spotify. We're on YouTube. Uh, Spotify video now available. All you got to do, if you have an Alexa-enabled device, you could just say, Alexa, play the walk around and it will play. So uh, we appreciate you. Remember to like, go ahead and subscribe. Thank you for listening.